now to a time of the word. And we're going to continue in part 10 of the Philippian series, Apostle Paul's letter from a prison cell to the Philippian church. And this is a powerful message today. I think it's very important that we understand as we come to this message that this was, and I'll share some of our experiences of mine as well, and we're going to be in Philippians chapter 3, verse 2 through 11. And the title of this message is Religion versus Relationship with Christ. Let me say that again. Religion versus Relationship with Christ. And I think it's one of the most, probably one of the, one of the most uh, greatest statements if we can find when it comes to Christianity versus religion, doctrines of man, denomination, things of that nature where it's focused on man-made ideologies, man-made doctrines, man-made systems, if you will, rather than focusing on Christ, God, the triune God alone for our salvation and the relationship with God. And it's a, there's a huge difference and a huge cavern or gap, if you will, that is between religion of man and a relationship with God. And, and, I, and I remember myself even coming from out of Roman Catholicism where it was faith plus sacraments, faith plus marriage, faith plus baptism, faith plus purgatory, faith plus thing, and continuing in this self-righteousness, works-based, trying to appease God with all the natural state and fleshly regards of mankind doing things, but yet uh, it was, it's either, my thing is, it's either it's grace or it's not grace. And so when I started reading the Word of God, the Bible that came into my vehicle when I was working for the Federal Aviation Administration, and I found the Bible in my car as a Roman Catholic, which we never really were told to read, no, there was encouraged to read. But I actually, the Holy Spirit drew me, put the Bible in the car, somehow I don't know how it got there, but I started reading it on a three-month business trip to Oklahoma City, and of course, reading it, and all of a sudden I'm enjoying it, and, and it just, wow, I'm like, what's this born-again thing? Wait a minute, what's, what's going on here? I never heard of that in my 39 years of life at that point. And so I just continued reading, and the Holy Spirit just opened my eyes and started reading this, and it was the Word of God that showed me and delivered me from a religious system of works, faithless works, to a place where I was a new creation in Christ, where it was none of me, but all of Him. And so this is what this is really about. I think this is one of the most, if not one of the greatest messages that anyone can receive, because in this world there are many different religions, if you will. And many of them, actually most of them, not all of them really, in essence, is a works-based thing. really is. Whether it's, you know, you know, I can go through all of them, but I'm not going to particularly talk about one, but, but for me it was, again, it was my experience as a Roman Catholic that, that I, I realized that I was relying on Rome, I was relying on indulgences, I was relying on things I have to do to, to help to try to go and get to my destination of heaven, which, again, I realized in that kind of a system, it was a dead end. There was no, it was like the bridge is out and I couldn't get across. It's a big cavern and I could not make it. And only when the cross of Christ comes along and trusting only Him, we can cross over to the other side and be able to experience a new life in Christ. So let's look at this and how Apostle Paul, writing to the Philippian church about the circumcision of doing things, of trying to appease God through the law of Moses, through customs, through traditions of man, through various type of meriting to appease and to gain salvation in that aspect. And he's comparing himself as a very pious man here. He's very pious. He's a very religious man as a Pharisee, uh, as he was saw before he became Paul. And so he's sharing to the Philippian church and he's sharing this love letter to us today trying to give us understanding and wisdom that that means really nothing as compared to having God's grace and faith and the gift of God. So let's read Philippians chapter 3, verses 2, 1 through 11. This is God's holy word. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, 
If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, pride, right? I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, and as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his suffering, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Let us pray. Father God, we are here this morning, and we thank you, Lord God, for your word. We thank you for Apostle Paul and his deliverance into a beautiful relationship with you, Father. And Father, this morning, hear those people here and watching and myself, Lord. We just thank you that we can have, and there's the availability of a relationship with you, knowing that all our righteousness is filthy as rags. And Father, we just ask you to help us to gain insight, wisdom, and Holy Spirit of God, draw those out there watching right now and those in the future to understand and be enlightened by the Word of God. And Father, he's going to speak as an oracle of God, and we pray this in Christ's name, amen and amen. First point is this, which is on your handouts. Privileges of birth and human achievement, however noble, count for nothing. And we're talking about Christianity. We're not talking about some great achievement or whatever. I mean, think about it. What are some of your great achievements? And often in our lives, in our life's history, there have been many achieving successes. And that's fine when it comes to certain things in the world, or finishing a degree, finishing this project, or whatever it may be in this life. There are many things we have we can be proud of in our lives. But when it comes to the Christian fact of a rebirth, of a salvation sense, the privilege of birth and human achievement in a worldly sense, however noble those things might be, and it comes to Christianity, the salvation process of God and His work, it counts for nothing. So for Christianity, it's quite the opposite of the world as obtained in a human sense of success or being successful in this world. In many of the world, there are religious systems that are in the category, if you will, of self-righteousness. That means I am going to do it myself. I can, you know, you, you're saying that I am my merits, by my works, by doing good, by paying charity, by going to church, by going to this. Not saying going to church is bad, but the fact is what the intention, what are you going there for? Is it to try to appease God? And that's fine in itself, but what about the act of justification and salvation? It is only through Jesus Christ and the cross, period. There's nothing else. You know, I always like the expression, I call this the, the do versus done. You might have heard that, you know. We try to do things to appease God. Do these things, do that. But with Jesus, it is done. He done it all. He's finished it. He went to the cross. And, and it's nothing. And so world religions, worldly religions and the systems of man-made religions are the do of appeasing God. And more often, false gods, man-made gods in certain religious systems in the world, the world where it's a based upon how much I do to do to appease a false god, a real god, or people around us. So Apostle Paul here is reminding the Philippians of his roots. And he's basically saying, nothing to be proud of, but he's saying, look, I have a right to boast. If it was a religious spirit like I used to have, these are the things I did. And so in the verses of our text this morning, he talks about these things. And I've written down six of them. He said, he was circumcised physically in his flesh on the eighth day for the Jewish law and custom. Secondly, he was born a Jew in the lineage of the tribe of Benjamin. So he's got that. He was circumcised he, on the eighth day. He, he was from the tribe of Benjamin as a Jew. And he was secondly, thirdly, excuse me, thirdly, he was a Pharisee. We see that in the scripture today as well. Pharisee, one who believed in the resurrection, who was following the laws of Moses, following pious and all he could do. He was a man of God, if you will, trying to appease God in his works. 
And then fourthly, he was a man who followed the law of Moses as best as he could. Fifthly, prior to his conversion, he went after new Christians, persecuting them, arresting them. And then sixthly, he was present when the first Christian martyr, deacon, who was a deacon, Stephen, was stoned to death, and the clothes were laid at his feet. So he was all part of the system that was against the will of God. He thought he was in God's will by doing all these pious acts. He was zealous for God in, in the aspects of doing all these things to appease God. But yet Christ, he sure he experienced Jesus and he knew about him. If he didn't see him, but he probably did see him around through the area in Jerusalem and beyond and heard of him for sure. But yet here he was when Stephen was stoned to death. He was right there saying, yes, yes, all right. He's, he's one of these weirdos people. He's at that cult, that, that following that, that, that Jesus guy from Nazareth, right? And uh, no, no, he's, he's, he's a blasphemer. He's a Baal. He's a, he's a Baal. He's a, a false god. He's not of the true God because God says we do this. We've got to do that. We have to go to the, we have to offer sacrifices. We've got to go do all these religious systems of works to appease God so that our sins will be forgiven. Well, guess what? They leave the temple and they lust after somebody or they use God's name in vain or they stole something even by accident. Oops! Failed God again. Now you're back to zero and you're separated from God and there it is. The sacrifices are only temporal sacrifices. And so Paul is here is reminding the Philippians of his roots, the fact of who he was. And Paul was this what? The epitome of a man of Jewish piety and servanthood. That's who he was. He was this Man, he was the Pharisee of Pharisees, taught by Gamaliel, the one of Pharisee, and, and his in schooling, and he was just ready to go to be the next whoever, next guy to get the promotion, right? In the system of works. Well, again, the problem was Paul was trying to appease God through self righteousness and works, and I call this the do list of self righteousness. Now, not all our do list, the do list, are bad in a certain sense. In the sanctification sense and purpose, it is okay to have a do list because God's already justified you by His done work, and we go and do those things that God calls us to do with your gifts, whatever those gifts of the Holy Spirit are. You know, for example, I always say, you know, sometimes we talk about married couples and we talk about the honeydew, not the honeydew melons, but the honey-do list, honey-to-do list, right? You know, the honey, you know, the wife will say to the honey husband, hey, I got a honey-to-do list. This needs to be finished. You need to do this. How about doing, taking care of that? And you got this honey-do list. Well, um, sometimes the men don't want to do the list. And sometimes, yeah, I'll get to that. And two days later, if it's not done or not, or, but it's a list of things to do. But when it comes to the fact about our Christianity and to understand that there's a difference between this religion works to do, and then we come to that relationship with God, it is done. We get rid of that list when it comes to being saved, to know, to know you have eternal life, 1 John 5, 13. So we know by the power of God that, that we confess Him and believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead, and you confess His Lord, Romans 10, 9 and 10, that you are saved. To the mouth, we speak life and we speak out to God. And with the heart, we believe that God raised him from the dead. We are saved. Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 17. So we have the salvation because God has drawn us, called us, and given us and opened our eyes. And we are justified. And we are now considered in the category of done. Religious systems are doing. God says, my son has done it. It's finished. He's paid for your sin in full on the cross. Hallelujah. And so the application is, are you still trying to do or are you willing to repent and submit to the gift of God's grace and receive the done? That's a question only we can answer with our hearts. I don't know your heart, you don't know my heart, but I don't know the people watching. But we have to get to the point of get rid of the do's and be the done. We are done. We are finished. It's like having a you know, an apple pie or cooking something, it's, it's, not, it's not cooked yet, it still needs to work, and that's that part of this thing, is you're waiting, you're waiting, and you know, what if your oven's not working, this or whatever, but, but when you're through Christ, the apple pie's done, it smells good, you're a sweet smelling aroma to the Lord, a fresh baked apple pie smells real good, right, get hungry. So, uh, you know, so, so it's that wonderful aroma, I said, ah, he's got Jesus, 
I don't see his sin any longer in his work system, but I see my son Jesus who was washed and clean with his precious blood on the cross. And now this person was once a sinner, yet still a sinner, but because of the blood, God doesn't see the sin, but sees us as a saint. One who is set apart, agios in the Greek, set apart for God's will to go forth and to love your neighbor as yourself and love the Lord and, and continue to grow in sanctification. And maybe God might give you a do list, but that comes later. So that's an important part. So again, um, that's the question is, are you still trying to do rather than be done? Second point is this on your handout. Relationship with Christ usurps religion and systems of man. Relationship with Christ, it usurps religion and systems of man. Well, the question for all of us is this. How many of you understand the system of this world, religions that are invented and established by man do not save you from your sinful state? They don't. You can do all you want. You can be the most charitable person. You could be, uh, you could be, for example, you know, uh, Father Teresa, not Mother Teresa, right? You can be a mother. You can do all these things and help charity and, and go and live in some place where you're, you're feeding poor. You know, that's great. And all, in a sense, it's doing a wonderful thing to do to help the poor, whatever. But if your heart's not right with God, if you're not understanding what grace means, the gift of God, and understanding that He's finished it, then you are trying to appease God, and then, well, Christ is going to say, I don't know you. In Matthew 7, he says, well, we did this for you, we did this, we cast the demon, we did we, we all these things, and you said, well, I don't know who you are, that's scary for the Lord to say that to you. When we have Christ, we are in a relationship with Him, and this relationship with Christ usurps religion and systems of man. So Apostle Paul, as his previous life, he was Saul, if you remember, named Saul, he was very successful, established in the Jewish sacrificial system and forever trying to earn God's favor and righteousness. And of course, in verse 7 through 11, Paul explains the importance of a relationship that is with God and only found through Jesus, having the knowledge given by the Holy Spirit that is worth more than any worldly system of works-based salvation. And so we see that. So all the works Paul did, he counted for loss, he says there. It was for nothing as compared to gaining the relationship and knowledge of Christ. Look at verse 7. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of who? Of Christ. And then verse 8. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth, worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, as trash, in order that I may gain Christ. So for Paul... This man-made system of trying to earn righteousness by the law of God, he considered it basically trash or garbage. And yet he was the man, and that whole system was, you know, promoting it and living that life, and yet he was lost in his own system like that. But rather, when Saul became Paul, he gained Christ by faith alone through the gift of God's grace. This is what the whole premise of Christianity is about. It's nothing about do, it's all about done. It's nothing about works, but it's all about finished. Finished work that Christ did for us on the cross. He gave the work on the cross. He nailed us into the cross by His merit, and thus we only receive the gift of God's grace through the charisma, the gift of God, the charisma, His favor. And it's wonderful to be favored by God, isn't it? Rather, Paul gained it by Christ alone, through faith alone, gift of God's grace. You know, knowledge of Christ is to be kept where? Hidden in our hearts, in our believers' hearts. And we have to be what? Romans 12, 1 and 2. We have to be transformed in the renewal of our minds. How? In the relationship with our Lord. It's, it's the study of the Word. It's through prayer. It's talking to Him, listening to His voice, and coming together and sharing, breaking bread, and, and just, just enjoying our life, but yet knowing that, wow, what such blessings we have, because I can speak to the Lord God in this relationship with him only through his son Jesus, not through Buddha, not through a denominational premise, not through this creed, although some creeds are good, they, they, they back up the word of God, but it's not a system of religion, it's not about some denominational statement of faith, we have to go to the scriptures, we have to stand on what the Bible says alone, through grace alone, through faith alone, and that's it, and it's a relationship that we build. Just like a mother and child, the child's in the womb of the mother, and it's, 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 there's this bond there, and the child delivers, and yet still, 
this this relationship building as the child grows, the infant to infancy to toddler to to a child to a teenager to an adult, and the mother and the father, the parents, and they're building that relationship. Hopefully, though well, some relationships are broken and things happen because of our sin nature, but in a Christian home, that relationship is built, building up the faith and building our relationship with the child, but also it's us with our Father in heaven. We build that relationship how? Through Jesus Christ, through the Word, through prayer, and allowing the Holy Spirit to teach us, to comfort us, to gain us insight, and to help us to grow, grow in sanctification, grow in that grace of God, grow in the Word of God, grow by our faith. You know, the disciples said, Lord, increase our faith. I, that's my prayer. Increase my faith, Lord God, that I continue to be bound to your love, and continue trusting in you. Sometimes in my flesh, and we do, we get caught up in what we can do, and you know, we try to do it our way, and all of a sudden, we, the consequences thereof happen, and we sometimes stumble, or we fall, and we do things the wrong way, and, and that's when we just realize, oh man, I, I gotta repent, I just gotta turn back to the Lord. Lord, I need to pray about this issue. I should have prayed in the first place. Otherwise, I wouldn't be in the mess I've been in, right? So sometimes we need to pray for the Lord God to guide us and help us in our decision making. And so again, uh, one thing that's important for us is, is it's again, it's not like the point says, relationship with Christ usurps religion and systems of man. And that's very important. I didn't have a relationship for 39 years as a Roman Catholic because I was ever forever depending upon the priest, the Roman Catholic priest. Well, he's going to say, you know, what does he do with the baby at baptism, which is not biblical. It's an extra biblical thing. You know, they sprinkle water baby in, by the Roman Catholic doctrine or statement, which is another extra biblical thing. They say that that priest, he has the power to save that baby right there. And that's what they do. But he's a fallible man. He's a sinner just like you and I. We're all sinners. We've all fallen short of God's glory. He can't save anybody. Who went to the cross for us? Not the Roman Catholic priest. It was only Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. He alone saves. So, and that's depending on when you confess with your mouth. A baby can't confess. All the baby wants to do is eat, pee, and poo, and that's it, and sleep. I mean, there's nothing they can do. Baby doesn't understand those things. It's when that baby comes to a point in their age where they understand and then they can say, I understand who Jesus did, what he was, what he did, how he went to the cross, how he saves us, and then there's a response. But a baby can't do any of those things. So that's a very, very, very uh, fallible system of work saying that this priest can save you, which is not. But then the rest of the life, you lose salvation, you pick it back up, and you fall, and you go to confession here, and you're constantly earning it to try to appease God by going to confessional, praying these ten Hail Marys, ten Rosary, ten Our Fathers, and then you leave the church, and then you know you sin, use sin, or use something wrong, you steal something, you commit adultery, or you use God's name in vain. Oops, I lost my salvation again. Go back to the confessional, back to the priest, and you catch this constant cycle of never having peace, never having this this wonderful peace that supports all understand all understanding of the world, and so you continue to be caught up in the system as I was in Roman Catholicism. And you don't know if you're going to heaven. You, there's no assurance. Because you keep supposedly losing your salvation every other day or every five minutes or whatever. It's just this constant. And Hebrew talks about that, that you're crucifying Christ all over again. That's ridiculous. You are saved once and for all. If you're a true believer, God by God, He has forgiven your sins. Now that doesn't give us a license to continue to sin, as Apostle Paul declared in his letters. But we have to be led by the Holy Spirit, a true believer. There will be fruit. There will be evidences that you're out of this system of works. You're not earning it. And you're in the salvation period of grace. And you're walking with the Lord. And you see that you don't want to do the bad things. You, you, you're trying your best as you can in the natural state of women or men to appease God in sanctification. Not to earn salvation. And those works will follow. Ephesians 2.10 talks about that. You know, as a matter of fact, I, I know this is not, I want to share, but it's part of the system, but I want to go to, to Ephesians, and I want to share that with you, because I think it's important. In Ephesians chapter 2, we know verses 8 and 9, talk about, for by grace you have been saved through faith, this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. That is justification. It's a <laughs> gift of God, it's not by works. But notice that's, that's, you're justified there. But notice in verse 10, that's sanctification. 
So Ephesians 2, verse 10 says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see the difference? You're saved by grace through faith, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, but then that's justification. But then you go to 10, but guess what? After you're justified, God says, I let you for a, be a, our workmanship for Him. We are Him. And in Christ Jesus, we go and do the good works that follow. See, there's a big difference. But Pastor Bob, you know, the Roman guest says, you know, in James 2 it says, you know, faith without works is dead. So it's written, well, wait a minute. I, he's talking, he's writing to Christians or sinners who have faith. And yes, it's true what James said, the, James said, bro, because, you know, we have to share the evidence. In other words, if there's no works that go along with your faith, then it's a dead faith. And that's the most important thing. So I went off a little bit, but I want to understand that people understand that this knowledge, this perfect thing, is, is a the man made system is trying to earn it, but relationship with God reveals that you already received it. Important. Let's go to point three. Relationship with God is based upon faith alone and Christ alone. Of course, we kind of talked about that already. I went ahead of myself, but, but that's the Apostle Paul saying here. You know, what does relationship look like? Is it superficial? Or is it based upon a deeper, more intimate connection? When we meet somebody who's an acquaintance in the village here or somewhere, we may know him. We say, how are you doing? You know, you, you know there's a person, you know, maybe you know who his room is. But is that a, that's more of an acquaintance type thing. It's not a true friendship relationship because like say you have with your spouse or your children or your grandchildren. That's more intimate, more closer. That's the big difference. We can be acquainted. People say, oh, I know who God is. Well, you know, well I, I've heard of Jesus, but, but does that mean they're in a relationship with them? No. There's a big difference. When a relationship means you communicate with that person, you want to get to know that person. Like when you're dating a spouse, you know, when Marianne and I, when we first met, I just couldn't be stay without her. I wanted to get to know her. I wanted to be with her 24 hours a day. I just... You know, in dating, you want to be with that person you love because you want to get to know them. You want to build a relationship. Well, religion doesn't do that. Religion only offers a dead, a dead system where it's just, okay, I got to do this. Yeah, I got to go through the motion. Okay, well, I got to go to church today. Yeah, I really don't want to go, but you know, I guess I'll go. You know, when I came to Christ, I couldn't stay away from the church. If they were open every day of the week, I was there. Bible study, prayer meetings, this, that. I was so hungry for the Lord. And that just shows you there's an evidence of the fruit. Nearly that fruit, and it's one relationship with God. And it's based upon what? Faith alone in Christ alone. Look at verse 9 of our text. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. F-A-I-T-H. Forsaking all, I trust him. F-A-I-T-H. Forsaking all, I trust him. Forsaking what all? Religious system. Forsaking my works, my merits. All the things that I'm trying to do to be a good person. Often I heard it's in religious circles. Little Johnny, you got to be good now. God doesn't want you to be a bad boy. you got to be a good boy now. But Johnny's never going to be a good boy because we're all sinners according to the Bible. Yes, we want to instill in our children, you know, this is good, this is bad, so choose the good things. Of course we want that. But little Johnny, guess what, you know? Little mama tells little Tom, don't, don't touch the stove, it's hot. What does little Johnny do? I'm going to go touch the stove and, hey, you know. I told you not to touch it, but what is that instinct? Our natural flesh, the instinct is, is to be uh, disobedient, to rebel. I'm not going to listen to mom and dad. I'm going to do what I want to do. It all starts when you're young. Who taught us that? No, it's inherited in our nature because of the sinful nature. And that's why there's no righteousness in our own selves from the law. The law reveals how unrighteous we are. Thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not use God's name in vain, thou shalt not covet thy neighbors, or whatever. And on and on, the Ten Commandments reveal our state that we've all failed God. And the Word of God says, you fill one commandment, you fail them all. And guess what? You ain't gonna get heaven. I guarantee that. Y'all gonna be lost forever. You got to come to Jesus Christ. That's right. That's what it's saying in Texas. 
I'm trying to talk like that, but it never works. But anyway, <laughs> uh, Bernadine knows the language. Yes. So, uh, so we have to remember that. It's, it's, again, it's faith. Our righteousness is no good. And that's what Paul's trying to just point this out. It's based on faith alone and Christ alone. And, and that's, again, I, I spoke a little about my deliverance from Roman Catholicism. Not, and I said, I, I don't condemn anybody who's Roman Catholic. This is just my experience. Please don't get that wrong for those maybe watching or here. This is just my experience that I constantly never had peace, always trying to earn to appease God and trying to do the things that the priest told me to do and, and go by him and go by what Rome says. And I was constantly in this state of instability. I was going to confession, break my sin, but then I knew I made a mistake a day later or a week later and oh, I have to go back and do it again. And well, then I realized as I read to the word of God and I seen 1 Timothy 2, 5 that it says there's only one mediator between God and man, and that's Jesus the Christ. Well, Apostle Paul, who was with Christ, who was an apostle, uh, he went to establish a church and he wrote two-thirds of, or one, uh, two-thirds of the Bible, the New Testament. Who am I going to trust? Am I going to trust somebody that was with Jesus and the apostles who wrote this? Or somebody just down the street living today who said, that, oh, no, 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 you, you, you got you to go confess to the priest. You've got to go to him for your sin. You can't, wait a minute. The Word of God says, I have, this, Jesus is the only one. Mary's not going to save me. Mary didn't die on the cross for me. Um, the Pope didn't die on the cross for me. My neighbor's dog didn't die on the cross for me. The guy on CNN News didn't die for me, or Fox News, whoever. It was only the Lord Jesus alone who went to the cross. He was worthy. None of us are worthy. Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 2, uh, you know, uh, Romans 3.23, that we're all sinners, we've all fallen short of God's glory because we're all sinners. And that's why it's important that we understand that it's not a righteousness. I was delivered when I read the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God, it says, Romans 10.17. So we need to hear the Word of God, not hear some fancy story or some system of doctrines or systems of this or man-made this or other things or make you feel good messages and that itchy ears want to hear. No, it's the Word of God. This is what I brought me to a, to a salvation in my life in 2000 in April. And it's the Word of God that I preach that can bring others to Christ. I'm just a messenger. I'm just a guy that's used, a sinner, saved by grace, just like you all. I'm nothing special. I'm just, we're all guilty as charged. But it's only by the grace of God, the gift that he gives us that. And that's important. We need deliverance from all these religious systems out there. Because they're not going to save you. No matter how much you charity do this or that, or you're not going to. No, it's first of all, salvation is in that relationship with Christ. And then in that relationship, we go and do God's will in our lives using the gifting he has given us. And then we come to our fourth point, final point. Relationship with Christ provides the only source of power Onto the resurrection of the believers. Let me say that again. Relationship with Christ provides the only source of power unto the resurrection of the believers. Well, how is it possible to become like Christ in his death and suffering? How does a believer share in sufferings and become like Christ unto death? Well, Paul here is emphasizing in verse 10 11 the importance of Jesus' suffering, death on the cross, and most important, the fact that Christ rose from the dead. Look at verse 10 in my text. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his suffering, becoming like him in his death. That by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Again, there is no human being here ever present, born or, or, or passed away, who can resurrect from the state of being dead. No life without what? The power of of Christ, the power of God to raise, the Holy Spirit of God to raise someone from the dead. Christ, if you know this, was the quote-unquote first fruit coming out of the ground after being dead and buried in a tomb. And believers like Paul need to know and understand that promise that as God raised Jesus from the dead, He will also raise true born-again believers from the dead as well. That's you and I. To know that our faith is not in vain, it is real, Christ is real. The evidence of the creation is all around us, from men without excuse. We see the attributes of God clearly. This does not just come about randomly by a couple of mass explosions of what? There had to have been something from something. You can't get something from nothing. 
God was there who designed it and created it and established by his voice. He spoke life and he created the universe and he created beings and he created the earth and we came from the dust and he breathed life into the human beings, Adam and Eve, and thus we've come from way back all the way from them to us. And there is no human being that can resurrect from the state of being dead. No life without the power of Christ. And so we need to understand that religious systems, guess what? Through their self-righteous merits, their works, the sacraments, etc., Guess what? There is no power that can save anybody nor raise even anybody from the dead. There is no power. As, as you know, Jesus spoke about the dead, dead bones and you know, dead men bones and whitewashed tombs. He was talking to the religious spirit of the Pharisees and Sadducees, the Sanhedrin of this time, when Jesus walked on the earth. And he called them what they were, hypocrites. You know, you put all these burdens upon the people. You have them to do this and do that. And, you know, you, you hypocrites, you go around doing this, but yet you're not doing it yourself. And you're telling people to do this, but you're not doing it yourself. You know, his hypocrisy. And Christ seen their hearts and realized that they were in this religious system. Think about this. From Malachi to the New Testament, we see Christ come along. 400 years, there was no word of prophecy. There was nothing going on between the whole four centuries until Christ came along. They were dead. They were following all these traditions of men, 613 laws of Moses, and all these things, trying to appease God. And they were got full of corruption, just like many denominations. They're full of corruption. They are full of worldly things, uh, like universities being progressively liberal, becoming full of bad stuff, instead of teaching the Word of God and doing the right things. Well, it's the same thing here with the religious system. And this relationship is where the power's at. The power to do, to raise you and I from the grave in the, in the resurrection, the last day when we'll be raptured, heart pays off to need the Lord in the air. Man ain't going to bring you up in the air unless you get in a plane. <laughs> and that has to come down eventually too. But when we go up, we have to come down. We're going to be with the Lord forever and ever. We might come down with the same during the millennial reign. Yes, we come down again to rule with the Lord and He'll be the su supreme you know, uh, author of everything, he will be the, the we call the theo theocratic, a theocracy, where he will be the, the whole world ru you know, ruler, not the Antichrist who wants to be there. But we, through him, we will be risen from the grave, we'll come, those who are dead will raise first, and we will follow who are alive to meet the Lord in the air and forever be with the Lord. That is resurrection power. Mohammed, Buddha, the Pope, uh, you know, whoever may be Confucius, they're not going to give us any resurrection. There's no power in them. They're dead. They're in the ground. They're dead. Previous popes, all the people, they have no power. Only Christ alone has the power through his resurrection power, the first fruit, to bring in that. Only the chosen elect of God who are in relationship with Christ will be delivered to where? To the kingdom of God. You know, I was thinking about as an illustration when it comes to power, think about this, you, if you have a car, if you've driven a car or had a vehicle, what happens if your battery's dead? It ain't going to start. No matter how much you try to do it, you, you can try to turn and turn and there's nothing going on. Well, you've got to have a good battery. And so when you put a battery in that battery charge, it has this potential energy. That potential energy turns to kinetic energy when we put the key in, we, we complete the loop circuit, which actuates, you know, it, it ignites the motor by putting a complete circuit to the starter, the starter turns, and then the motor and the pistons, the electronics, and they get firing, the, uh, the fire plugs, and all of a sudden the gas explodes, and, and then the motor starts going. And then from that point, you can go from point A to B. You can drive and actually go somewhere. Well, in Christianity, if we don't have a good battery, if we don't have a, if our heart ain't pumping, a heart is like a battery, it's the, it's that keeps us, all the blood flowing, keeps us walking, allows us to move from one point to another, one room to another, that's the same kind of power only that the Holy Spirit gives us, is that same kind of power, that juice, if you will, the electricity, when the lights are out, there's nothing we can do, but when we have the power, we can, we can blend those things, we can put on our stoves, we can do those things that we need to do, but without the energy, without the power, it ain't going to happen. Well, that's what it was about man-made systems of religion of man. There's nothing they can do to help you, to save you. You'll be dead in the grave, and, and that's it. Well, my question in, in closing is, how about you? What and who will you choose to follow? Christ alone, or some man-made system, or religious group, or denomination? I report you decide. And I think we need to know that it's about relationship with the Lord. And Apostle Paul is telling the 
Philippi, the Philippian church, that they need to not follow the circumcision, the law of Moses, all these things, because it all has failed. Although the law of Moses is righteous, the, the Ten Commandments is, is, is perfect law, Jesus fulfilled all the requirements, but guess what? We failed it when we tried. Many times we've all failed. And that's why the only thing we can become righteous with is by the grace of God, through faith alone, through Christ alone. And it's not a religious system. It's only a relationship with God our Father. And I pray that you will be in a relationship starting today with the Lord. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved in the past tense. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you that, Father, that you are the living God. You are the saving God. Your Son is the only way. Father, we know your word says that. Jesus said that I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Not through any man-made system, not through any denominational thing, nothing. No man on this earth who are sinners can save nobody. So, Father, today I pray that those watching this video will come to the saving grace of Christ and understand that it's only through grace, a gift, we are saved through our faith through believing in Him. And Father, help those who are dealing with physical problems, spiritual problems. And Father, deliver those who are caught up in cults and demonic and satanic ways, Father. And help, Lord, we pray for those who are dealing with the hurricanes that they've gone through and the death and people and rebuilding. And Father, we just pray for the wars. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray, can you pray uh, as these wars unfold that we know it's been prophesied in your word in the Bible. But Father, prepare us. Keep us ready. Keep, our, keep the candles lit, ready for the return of our Lord, Father. Help us to maintain our faith and to continue our walk of faith in you through that wonderful gift of grace. And help us to continue building our relationship with you, seeking your will in our lives. We do pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Our closing song is a good one, and that's all about the resurrection. He didn't remain in the grave. Jesus came out of the grave, and he lives. And because if he lives, we can face tomorrow no matter what, because then all fear is gone. God sent him.